transport issues. Um, I guess I should have taken an Uber or something like that. Um, okay, what is my talk actually called? <laughs> Does anybody know? Uh, I, you know, this is it. I know, I know. What, what, what is it? The financial, uh, the financial good, good, I can do that. Uh, social art, and economic impact of structures art. influence the art world. Oh, okay. I knew it was about that, but it's actually called that. Okay, <laughs> um, I can do that. Um, I mean, I, I, I looked at the description only last night, and, and this is the first time that not only did I not write the description of the essay, I didn't even read it. Um, so it leaves me in a bit of a... Uh, but, <laughs> No, but I guess I, I, I have strong opinions on these issues, so <laughs> let, me, let me enunciate some of them. Um, whenever I think about the relationship of finance and art, uh, I always think of an old friend of mine named Chris Kakamis. He was a, is a, a sculptor, and he's a sculptor who largely works in paper. He's these very elaborate uh, and beautiful sort of poppy uh, images made out of uh, folded and glued paper. And um, Chris at one point was broke, actually many points Chris was broke, Chris was usually broke. Um, but once he was um, very broke and he decided that he was going to make a sculpture which completely consisted of the words, I need money. Um, so he, he, he wrote the words, I need money, and made them out of paper, painted each uh, letter in a different co primary color, and took it down to the gallery. And he said nothing he's ever done sold so fast. It just was instantly snapped up. He got uh, six or $7,000. He was incredibly happy. Um, and then a few months later, whoever bought it, I don't remember who that was, um, sold that sculpture to the Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, who liked it so much they put it on their tote bags uh, that they sold in the shop downstairs. So now all over New York, there's people wandering around with little bags that say, I need money in bright primary colors, and he isn't getting a penny for any of them. So it's a beautiful illustration of a basic principle of the relation of art and finance, which is um, who's scamming who, uh, which is kind of something everybody's always trying to figure out because art in its contemporary form largely consists of a series of arguments about what art is. Uh, and the matter is ultimately often decided by money. Um, it's a really interesting thing also that I've, I've observed on many occasions that um, artistic neighborhoods, sort of bohemian neighborhoods, have tended to accumulate around financial districts in major cities. There is a kind of intrinsic relationship uh, between artistic avant-garde uh, and, and finance capital, or there has come to be. I don't think there always was. Uh, and I, I was kind of always trying to figure out why that was and what that relationship was. Uh, to some degree, I, I think it's based on the fact that um, both of them are kind of phony versions of, of, of something. Um, the financiers are essentially phony capitalists. Uh, they're you know, capitalists that don't actually make anything. And uh, the... the um, Bohemians are increasingly sort of phony proletarians. You know, they're actually working with their hands. They know how to use acetylene torches and play around with industrial solvents. And um, they get their hands dirty in the most literal of ways. And they make stuff. Uh, but, you know, they are, for the most part, not a simulation of a working class, which is the perfect com complement to, to the financial simulation of the capitalist class. Uh, and, and so it, doesn't, it makes sense that both of them kind of think of themselves as putting something over on the other. Uh, especially, and you could think that, that, you know, that one percent of the one percent who are the art collectors of, of the world are the ultimate, you know, they see their ability to turn random objects into art, or what might otherwise seem like random objects into art, that they sit on top of this gigantic ap institutional apparatus which resolves the question of what is art in any, which is, as I say, is the entire discipline of art is basically an argument about this. Um, you know, they, they ultimately cast the deciding vote by buying stuff. So, so it's a way that, especially since those institutions ultimately, you know, are rooted in museums, which are kind of this uh, secular equivalent of, of places of worship, uh, they become 
their money becomes a kind of sacral grace which which baptizes ordinary objects from their perspective magically and turning them um into something of higher value and ultimately validates uh the value of this very abstract finance capital which no one's quite sure what it is and and um whether it even really exists of course it does i mean what what finance really is is other people's debts but we don't need to go into that um the question i I've talked about this a little in the past. The interesting question might be, how did we come to this, and, and what are the larger political implications? One thing I've always been fascinated with is, is the you know, way art functions as what a linguist would call marked and unmarked term. That the marked and unmarked terms are words that operate on two different levels of abstraction, uh, sort of the way you might say animal, vegetable, and mineral. Uh, so vegetable stands for all, veg, uh, is both there's an opposition between a vegetable and a fruit, right? Uh, but both of them are vegetables when you compare them to animals and minerals. So, so um, if you take that kind of linguistic logic where one of a category represents the others, it's always the physical objects, uh, art as sculpture, painting, drawing. And when people say art, they assume they mean physical objects of art, even though the, the arts actually includes everything from opera to origami, I guess. Um, poetry included. So why is it when we say art, we're always thinking of a thing? Um, there's various pe people who have come up with hypotheses about this, but the most interesting that I've seen are by Alain Caillé, the French uh, founder of the famous Most Group, the, um, and um, Boris Groys, uh, who, I, Kaye makes the point that the idea of the artist as hero really emerges from the Industrial Revolution. It's exactly at the moment when you have mass production of objects that are all the same where you know absolutely nothing about the people who made them, and it doesn't matter at all, that you have another category of object emerges where you know, in theory, everything about the person who made it and, and who that person is makes all the difference in the world. In fact, the only thing that really matters to establishing its value. So it's as if the old idea of a craft, ideal of a craftsman and splits it in two and takes off in schismogenetic, you know, opposite directions. Um, so at the same time, you have um, you have the notion of the artistic vanguard and the political vanguard basically uh, emerge at exactly the same time. It's the same idea. Um, there was a debate between Saint-Simon and Kant in the wake of the French Revolution about who would be the, sort of replace the priesthood as um, the socially integrative ideological force of the new industrial society or new revolutionary society, depending on um, whether you're doing a left or a right version of the same thing. And the, art, the question is whether it would be scientists, which is, was Auguste Comte's idea, or whether it would be artists, which was Saint-Simon's. But in either case, they were seen as a vanguard. Uh, and, and playing a very, very similar role. And in fact, socially, there was always a, a remarkable overlap between who was actually in sort of artistic bohemian circles and who was in revolutionary circles. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu did some fascinating research on, on who actually went to bohemian shows in the 19th century. And surprisingly, it wasn't actually who you think it was. There's a stereotype that they are all the kind of down and out rebellious children of the bourgeoisie who are then going to like be living off their parents' money who are eventually going to go off and get jobs in the family firm. And maybe about a third of them were. But a lot of them were actually children of peasants because this is the first generation where um, there was universal education after 1848. And uh, essentially, you had a first generation of people who, you know, came from very modest backgrounds, got a bourgeois education, and then suddenly discovered that just having a bourgeois education didn't mean you actually got to be part of the bourgeoisie. Uh, so they were they were pissed off, and they had like the whole entire history of social theory to back up their pissed offness. And this is really uh, that coalit sort of meeting place: the downwardly mobile children of the bourgeoisie, professional classes, the upwardly frustrated. Um, children of the popular classes becomes a basis both for revolutionary, um, you know, think of um, Chairman Mao, the school librarian, children of peasants, and Joe and Law, or you know, Che meets Fidel. Uh, that's the basis of both revolutionary alliances and artistic bohemian um, circles ever since. Um, what, now, all of 
of that, that tradition sort of explodes, as revolutionary coalitions, it still somewhat exists, uh, really does explode and is destroyed after World War One. And um, World War One is the first occasion I know of where you see this very interesting sociological phenomena. People haven't really talked about it that much as such. Uh, but I think it's very important. I, I call it flame out. Uh, the idea of flame out is uh, that there are, at certain moments of global revolution, you have a moment where some genre of expressive cultural activity kind of goes mad and runs through every logical, possi radical possibility, formal logical, uh, logic of form, uh, 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 where formal radicalism and, and political radicalism can be the same thing. It kind of runs them all out within a matter of three or four years. If you think about it, 1917, that happened with the tradition of avant-garde art. Uh, you have Dada, you have Bohemianism, they're just doing everything you could possibly imagine that's crazy and subversive. You know, they'll have shows where the only way to do the get in is to you know, crawl through the toilet and the men's room in a bar and you know they, uh, they put on uh, plays where they make the audience go insane and throw things at them and have little um, ducks um, catching catching the, the raw vegetables that are thrown at them and 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 you know every kind of formal thing you can do um, and they kind of run through all the gestures and this is one reason why a hundred years later you know you read about radical art they still always go on and on about Dada and surrealists because they kind of did it all and they didn't leave anybody else any formal radical gestures to do and if you think about it in 1968 the exact same thing happens again a world revolutionary moment with uh, the tradition of continental philosophy. Uh, essentially, everybody goes mad, and within about five or six years, they say every radical thing you can say, which is both formally radical and, and conceptually radical and politically radical at the same time. So suddenly everybody's saying, yes, truth is a form of violence, man does not exist. You know, and they just sort of say every radical thing you can think of, and then the rest of us are left with, now, what do we do now? <laughs> so once again, just like we're always constantly referring back to art of that period of 1917 through the 20s, um, we're still constantly recycling French theory from uh, basically 1968 to maybe 83 when they sort of run through all the logical possibilities. So after that, it's true, I, I, I always say uh, it, it's incredibly frustrating because it's as if, um, it's as if, you know, why are all these people think they're so cool and they're reading this stuff from French theory from, 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 from the 70s? It's like, all, it's like they're still listening to classic rock and think they're hip. It's like the same period as Led Zeppelin and Fleetwood Mac, um, except they're just endlessly going on about Deleuze as if he's like, you know, blowing away everything. Um, almost 50 years ago now. Okay, so, so why do we have these periods and what do we do afterwards? Um, I think that in the case of uh, contemporary art, essentially you're in a situation where all the four ways you can be formally radical and politically radical at the same time get exhausted within a couple of years. Um, and they're left with a, you know, relatively few political possibilities. One is, of course, to simply be formally radical and not be politically radical, you know, if you're Andy Warhol or Jackson Pollock, and you know, a lot of people did that. Another one is to be politically radical and not be formally radical, if you're, say, Diego Rivera, um, or you know, uh, a lot of political art. You know, it doesn't necessarily breaking conceptual barriers. It's it's good art and it's it's radical. Or you can be formally radical and politically radical and not do art, which is what the situation is. Some people like that do. Uh, but those are essentially the three things you can do. There was an attempt to rethink the spiritual basis um, of the whole apparatus. Joseph. Boys who might be seen as, as uh, embodying that possibility, but really in the battle that uh, people describe between Boys and Warhol for the direction of art, you know, Warhol won, as we all know. Um, so this is as far as I had gotten uh, thinking about this, but um, the more I, I, I kind of integrate that idea of how we got to the situation where we're in now, where we have the financial classes and, and our, our artists essentially both thinking they're scamming the other, um, it's kind of with this kind of baptism of money. Uh, it, I think that we need to think about the sort of key figures from the very end of that first period of artistic flame out. Um, 
the, the last of the Dadaists, Marcel Duchamp, who introduced essentially the notion of managerialism into art, that like selecting things with the famous fountain uh, is uh, itself an artistic gesture. And that validation of managerial labor uh, has become more and more come to define what art is. And that corresponds, I think, with um, a direct line from, from that to you know, Warhol to, I don't know, Jeff Koons or something like that, where the salesman, the manager, the sort of American tradition of the guy who just through his own uh, gift of gab and bunkum sort of turns something into marketable commodities has come to uh, increasingly dominate uh, what art has, has become. And what strikes me is this is appropriate considering the new forms of class alignment that have happened within capitalism over the course of the post-war years. Um, now, what has happened, especially since the 70s, but it's already starting to happen, is, is that like, you know, the traditional collectors were genuine capitalists, you know, Frick, Rockefeller, Carnegie, all those people, you know, filled their houses with uh, contemporary avant-garde art. And, and Increasingly, as time goes on, um, the nature of capitalist classes shifts away from the industrial, the old-fashioned robber barons, to finance capital, which is itself increasingly bureaucratized. So the upper echelons of the sort of bureaucrat uh, executives, basically corporate bureaucrats, or in uh, large firms, kind of fuse together with the financial speculators who then become bureaucratized themselves and hedge funds, venture capital of one form or another. Um, and uh, before you know it, there's a sort of new financialized capitalist class, which then forms a new political alliance. And this is very critical because it's the same period where what had been left-wing political parties who formed, you know, who relied on the proletariat for at least a large part of, of their political base, increasingly turned away, and very self-consciously in many cases, it can be documented, turned away from the proletariat to the professional managerial classes, the Democratic Party under Clinton is all very explicit, and Tom Frank has written about this. He actually found smoking gun documents with the Democrats say, why do we need the unions anyway? Why do we need this working class base? We can go to the people. You know, we don't have to like, you know, rely on the nurses in the hospital. We can talk with the people managing the hospitals. We don't have to need to rely on the teachers. We can rely on the people, the school administrators. Um, the, the professionals uh, became the new sort of base of support for what formerly left-wing parties. Uh, and um, at that same time, you find phenomena happening within the art world where the new financialized elites who, who go on art spending binges actually themselves are increasingly reliant on a managerial conception of art. Uh, at first of all, it's happening on the ground. I mean, more and more people I know who go to art school say you don't even learn how to like use a blowtorch or all that stuff that you used to do. Or if you do, it's like this kind of cheap thrill uh, because increasingly artists get other people to actually do it. So they're in the situation of designers and managers themselves. But even more, of course, as we all know, you have curation as being more and more important. And, and, and that importance of curation corresponds with something that's happening in all creative industries. It's a phenomena that I have labeled bullshitization. Uh, so, so it's not, there's not only creation of endless new types of bullshit industries, you have within existing industries, uh, endless accretion of, of levels, I call it managerial feudalism as well, uh, these endless intermediaries that are placed between the guys with the money and the people who are actually making or doing something. Um, you see it in uh, journalism, suddenly there are producers in addition to just editors and writers. You see it in Hollywood, oh my god, there's like seven of them now, you know. Script writers say, if you want to know why movies suck, I mean, this is the reason there's 18 different people intervening in the script. Because there's all these, you know, I'm the uh, executive vice president for vision management or something like that. And, you know, I have nothing to do. I have no excuse really for my existence. So I have to like come up with one by sort of interfering on every level of the creative process. But but increasingly those guys who, who had at first just been kind of interfering in the creative process decide they're the creative geniuses. And um, you see this above all in the art world where curators are large in the same way that critics of the early part of the century seem to be a face of the artist. Now that it's the curators are um, guys like Adam Chimchik uh, does the famous marginal art exams. There's a lot of people's thing is the apotheosis of this. And Documenta a couple of years ago, where he simply just took 
folk art, primitive art objects, you know, um, 60s record sleeves, and to sort of mix them together with things by, by recognized artists. So just basically a way of aggressively saying, look, I'm the guy who creates value here. So, so the managerial classes, in the same way as they've appropriated from the proletariat, that role of being the official allies of the financial elites, political allies, you know, managerialism has taken over in every level of physical art as well. Um, now, um, I want to think about then um, poetry in this regard, because this is a poetry festival. And um, what I think is interesting and significant about the relation of poetry and finance, you know, I wanted to say that, uh, that you know, poetry is like a hot bath that renders you infertile, but at least you can't sell it. Um, I mean something very specific by this. I, I had a friend who was, told me once about the history of contraception. Early part of the 20th century, when they were doing the initial research on contraceptive techniques, um, one of the things that the early feminists discovered is one of the most promising things, um, ways of preventing childbirth, was that if a man takes a very hot bath for over 15 minutes, he's very unlikely you know, uh, to, to fertilize anybody you know, for the next 12 hours. And this has excited people for a while, but there was, the research was never completed, and we don't really know uh, in detail how to do this. And the reason why is they realized there's no way you can sell this to anybody. Uh, you know, like a condom, IUD, all these things, you know, there's something you can market a pill, but you can't really sell somebody a hot bath. Either you have a bathtub or you don't. Um, and um, as a result, we don't know about this. And I think poetry has a status a little bit like that. Um, poetry is something that you can't really market. And, and as a result, you know, my friend Sophie Carpetti you know, always points this out. If you compare the art, art community and the poetry community in, in London, for example, you know, poets are very cooperative. You know, they're, they're, they're constantly, you know, doing projects together and mutually supportive in all sorts of ways that artists, I mean, some are, there are obvious exceptions. Artists in general tend to be much more individualistic and suspicious of each other. In an art, there is a prize you could win, you know? And in poetry, it, you know, you're never gonna get rich from being poetry. Everybody knows that there's a, it's not even really, it doesn't even really enter the picture. Um, so there's something kind of wonderful about that. Uh, it creates a different social relations because finance just can't get its teeth into poetry and never will. Um, it also evokes emotions that are very different, uh, I think, uh, than the more material arts. Notably, I think, um, hatred. I think the importance of hatred as an emotion, as, as a creative emotion, is very often um, vastly underrated. I think it's um, hatred is, is perhaps the quintessential political emotion, uh, but in, in a way, it's it's the foundation I've always felt for any you know, legitimate idea of love. Um, all love is founded on hatred of some kind, uh, but. It's very interesting. You never hear people talk about hating art, do you? Um, people are indifferent to art. They're annoyed by art. They try to ignore it. Uh, they find it confusing. They might, you know, find it irritating that some people worship it, or they might worship it themselves. But they tend not to hate it. But lots of people hate poetry, um, and and it seems to be part of the nature of poetry. I actually had this book and this talk gave me an excuse to read some of it that I bought just for the title. It's called The Hatred of Poetry. Um, and um, it had a passage I thought was, was very uh, moving. It said, every few years an essay appears in a mainstream periodical denouncing poetry or proclaiming its death, usually blaming existing poets for the relative marginalization of the art. And then the defense is light up on the blog sphere before the culture. Um, if we can call it a culture, it turns its attention if we can call it attention, back to the future. Why don't we ask what kind of art is defined, has been defined for millennium by such a rhythm of denunciation and defense? Many more people agree they hate poetry than can agree what poetry is. I too dislike it, and have largely organized my life around it. <laughs> so, so I think this is very interesting, that, that, that poetry, it strikes me because it can't really be commoditized, it won't, and nobody really imagines that it could be, um, is, is essentially, in its nature, a weapon. Um, you know, Boris Groys argued that art 
and of course he meant physical art, material art, is the um, auto critique of the commodity. It is a commodity that critiques itself, or at least asks what is art, what is a commodity. Um, it does so by various types of irony and play, um, but it doesn't really do it by anger and hatred very much. Whereas poetry is essentially a weapon. Um, they use uh, famously one of my first images of poetry that I really liked was I once read that Irish poets used to be able to rhyme rats to death. Um, that really impressed me. Uh, so it's something essential to the nature of poetry that it is toxic in a really good way. Uh, so I, I would suggest here that that's what we should do in this place, that we should unleash that sort of venomous power of, of poetry um, on the very financial powers that cannot contain it. Thank you.